All right. Uh, now we are going to have uh, uh, four presentations in uh, this session. And the title is Repositories and National Flowering Centers. And the procedure is uh, just like yesterday. So each uh, presenter gets five minutes and then five minutes for question and, and uh, uh, discussions. And uh, well, first talk is about the uh, Arhe Suite, or is it Arche? And uh, Mateus Soltak will speak. The floor is yours. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm Mateus uh, Soltak. Uh, yeah, I'll talk about uh, Arche uh, repository solution uh, we decide to develop. So yeah, the first question is why we decided to develop a new solution. And the answer is pretty simple. We wrote down all the features we wanted and it turned out nothing supports all of them. These missing features form two broad groups. One is reliable transaction support and what's connected with that reliable backups, but it's a topic for a separate talk. Uh, the second group is connected to metadata and I will focus on that. We wanted a native RDF support uh, with some goodies on top of that. Uh, so why are we so attached to RDF? First of all, we already had a Fedora 4 based uh, repository, uh, which stores uh, metadata in RDF and we wanted easy migration. Uh, second, we like linked open data and semantic web and RDF is technology to go for that. Uh, last but not least, RDF provides us a nice way of dealing with named entities. Uh, instead of storing uh, named entities data next to every binary resource, uh, which causes data duplication and introduces a risk of uh, metadata inconsistency, we can store only one copy and refer, uh, refer to it. Next slide, please. Uh, to make it work, we implemented a repository where each repository resource has a corresponding node in RDF metadata graph. That's pretty obvious, but also Every node in uh, RDF metadata graph has a corresponding uh, re repository resource. And optionally, every repository resource can store binary content, a single binary content. On top of that, in our repository solution, every uh, repository resource or, uh, can store many uh, identifiers or in RDF terms, every node in a metadata graph uh, can have many URIs and none of them is better than other. All, all are equal and when data are ingested, any of them can be used. A repository automatically recognizes any uh, identifier and maps it, ma maps it to the uh, corresponding repository resource. And thanks to that, we avoid uh, data duplication, creating separate resources, uh, which are the same uh, named entity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the drawback of uh, such a data organization is that um, metadata are not available locally. Uh, let's say we want to know the name of the author of the resource free. It's not available directly on the resource free. It has to be fetched uh, from uh, the uh, resource storing this named entity uh, data. Uh, to deal with that, our repository on the API level uh, provides an easy way to, to fetch broader sets of metadata, broader RDF subgraphs, like metadata of a given resource and metadata of all these RDF neighbors at once, or metadata of a resource and metadata of all its relatives, like children or parent, according to a given RDF property. Uh, at once. And yet this is, uh, addresses this issue. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, at the end, I would like to mention that our repository solution has been developed with a Clarin integration in mind. So it out of the box uh, supports federated content search integration, uh, switchboard integration, VCR integration. It also comes with rich and fast OAIPMH templating engine. So for example, we don't store CMDI, CMDI records as 
uh, XMLs as physical files. We generate them on the fly uh, from RDF metadata using the templating engine, and it works yeah, pretty pretty well. We are uh, happy with that. Uh, I think that's everything I can squeeze in five minutes. Uh, if yeah, uh, someone has uh, more questions, whatever, uh, yeah, uh, I think the breakout room tomorrow will be the, <laughs> the best, uh, best option. But yeah, also we have uh, five minutes uh, uh, afterwards, yes, at the end. So uh, yeah, but thank you for your attention. That's uh, all uh, on my side here. <laughs> So, Thomas Geilat, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, so good, uh, good afternoon or morning to everybody. Uh, so, the project I'm going to present was conducted last uh, spring, in which we had a problem, which was to upload a corpus of Learner English on a database. And for this, we had to make the choice of a particular database. And we went for a data repository because it allowed the management of dynamic linguistic data sets. Um, and this project was conducted um, at the University of Rentoux. So the idea that we had was to upload our corpus online and there are several platforms and most of the platforms allow the download of, um, well, we wanted to upload the, the, the corpus to make it available for the community. Um, and we tried to look at how the community would download the corpus and most of the services allow a static download of the corpora. That is to say that once people have downloaded the corpus, they can process it. But if the corpus online has changes or dated, then they have to really download the data again. And that creates a risk of obsolescence in the downstream projects from users. So our proposal was to use a dynamic database, a repository um, that can be queried live on demand uh, by different scripts through APIs. And that allows uh, real-time querying and also the creation of data sets as required. You can move to the next uh, slides, please. Um, so current practices, as I said, uh, provide single persistent uh, URLs for full data sets, which is the case of the U, Manum, or Toulong, as far as I understand. Um, at the same time, what we observe is a move towards interoperability. So there's a stronger need, uh, a growing need for full uh, NLP pipelines that go from ingestion um, to creation of data sets and machine learning uh, tasks. And this means that tools have to be interoperable and data sets also have to be interoperable. And our idea is to provide a, a system in which uh, extra tools can pipe into our database to extract uh, data as it is created. You can move to next slide. Um, so we conducted a use case with the learner corpus I was talking about, and the uh, corpus is made up of uh, uh, documents created by about learners of English and learners of French as a foreign language. There's you have the details about the corpus on the screen. Um, um, the database, the repository, is actually supported by Humanum Nakala, which is a French project at national level that supports all research centers. And the Nakala repository is organized in such a way that data are made up of collections of data items. And each data item is assigned a persistent URL. And the data items are also grouped in collections. And each collection is assigned a persistent URL. So you can literally uh, tap into each level of, of any level of the, the corpus structure. And the way we structured our corpus called CIL um, in NAC is to, um, to create one learner, one data item in the database to, uh, that corresponds to one learner. And this one learner, this one data item is characterized by a set of met metadata, which are Dublin core, and also a set of data files that correspond to the actual files, such as the recordings from the learners or the transcriptions or their writings. And also, a metadata file, which is a CSV file made up of uh, the learner metadata, which could not be encoded in the Dublin Core metadata. Next slide, please. 
So this is a summary of what I've just said in terms of the structure, and we can move on to the next slide, please, Naomi. Um, it's an ex example of how uh, the, the, the data sets can be created. Basically, what we want to do from this uh, NACLA repository is to use their, the provided API for the automatic ingestion of the data from our backend here in the university where learner data is collected. And we provide also a series of scripts that use another set of APIs in the NACLA uh, structure, which allows allows for data querying based on the, met, the Dublin core metadata. And once the querying is done, for example, selecting just the French learner texts or just the French learner transcriptions or and uh, any kind of uh, querying we want, we also add in the pipeline in the scripts or scripts a set of um, tools that provide post annotation, for example, so we can trigger the UDPI pipeline. And the final result is that the user, by running just a simple program, gets to query the database live and to obtain a data set that, uh, that uh, includes enriched uh, linguistic data sets, including also the metadata that comes from the learner. So for example, it's possible to have annotation as well as metadata in the same data sets allowing for further analysis with machine learning methods or statistical methods. Next slide, please. So the perspectives are to develop uh, more customized scripts uh, for data annotation in all sorts of, in all linguistic fields, uh, using different types of tools that are available and made available by the community. Uh, the idea is also to use the annotated data and to shape annotated data to conduct particular uh, learner language analysis tasks, such as predicting learner uh, proficiency level. We try to develop models uh, for the production of, of CEF4 levels, for example. Um, one limitation that we have seen so far in, 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 the, in our system is that it doesn't provide global state versioning. So it means that we cannot go back to a previous state of the database, which would uh, at the moment prevent uh, longitudinal comparisons between different states of, of the corpus as if we wanted to. But this is certainly something that Nakela Humanum, an issue that we, they will address in, in the coming years. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next presentation would be about uh, Clara in Italy and uh, Dario Del Fonte is going to talk. Here you are. Good morning, everybody. And uh, so thank you for uh, uh, being here all. This is the project I'm worked in, in the last months uh, with uh, Monica Monaghini, Francesca Frontini and Valeria Cuochi during my period as, as research fellow at um, uh, Institute for Computational Linguistics and Toads and Poly in Pisa. The idea is uh, uh, Clarin uh, IQ resources in Clarin Eric, a bird's eye view. So we started from thinking about the four point of access uh, to Clarin resources. So uh, the virtual language observatory, the federated content search, uh, the language resource switchboard and the Clarin resource families. And um, we all know these four points of access and how these uh, res the resources are available. Next slide, please. So um, the idea was that uh, uh, we considered that national consortia should monitor regularly these four points of access in order to verify if these resources are available or not and how these resources are available and how these resources are accessible. And uh, uh, the state of art suggests that there are different quantitative methodology to assert and to um, evaluate the accessibility of language resources, but a qualitative uh, uh, method, method um, which was uh, available also to like end user and uh, any type of researcher in order um, to assess the, if they could easily find the resources they, sh they need and they use them as intended was absent. So this absent, the, the, the idea was to develop a qualitative methodology, which can be used by anyone to check and analyze the presence of language resources available in the Clarinate Consortium. And the, 
our secondary and aims was uh, were to assess the Italian consortium presence within Clarineric, to devise a reproducible qualitative methodology from the user perspective, and so to evaluate the feasibility, the reliability, and searchability of Clarineric language resources in the VLO in this sense. So we focus our methodology starting from the VLO. Next slide, please. So we all know the um, technology infrastructure of uh, Clarinet and um, how Clarinet is uh, um, uh, represented within the, uh, the Clarineric. Next, next slide, please. And uh, so we ended up in developing this methodology and in abstracting the different steps. So basically, we started from the selection of the National Project Tab um, on the VLO, so focusing on the language resources of interest in this sense. And uh, uh, we check which language resources uh, are shown how are presented in the VLO, filtering for languages, organization, collection, and resource type. And so we then uh, check the represent of duplicates. Then we check the status of the activation, for example, of links to the original place. And then we register all the inconsistencies in terms of accessibility and availability. Next slide, please. So um, this is the bird's eye view now we can get from this starting initial um, um, case study. So as you can see, we were um, uh, the, there are 40, 439 uh, language resources within Clarin uh, it consortium. And uh, interestingly, uh, there are uh, 10 different languages and with Latin, which is the most represented and, uh, and um, Italian is the third one, as you can see from the fourth one from the image above. And also there are uh, eight different organizations involved uh, like depositing the resources with the at, um, current EAT consortium. Next slide, please. There are also other things to be considered, like the number of the different collections with Ali literary resources, which is the most represented. And uh, also there, are, there is a variety of resource types for each data provider, as you can see here. So next slide, please. Um, a brief, like our concluding remarks as that uh, at first availability, so, um, we had some problem with cases of unspecified availability, which might lead to amendments of the records. And this is important to check every time the availability of uh, these uh, resources, the actual availability. Then uh, the aspect of granularity. So um, sometimes it's important to consider uh, nested versus non-nested options when preparing a resource. Because we find that, for example, in the case of our Alim literary resource, we find that uh, um, like uh, the resource uh, present a lot of different uh, um, records, and but each record corresponds to only one collection, which is Alim National Resource Alim Archive. In this sense, uh, uh, it's important to consider these aspects when uh, a resource is prepared. And finally, the fact that applicant namings, uh, we, it's important to pay attention to differentiate those resources and corresponding to the same work with different editors. There are some resources, records, and some records which uh, uh, present were relative to um, the same um, work by the same uh, writer, but with different like um, translator. And sometimes uh, they dwell low counts uh, these uh, res the record are as being duplicate and uh, it's not it's not are not counted uh, in the general account so these are the final uh, concluding remarks thank you for your attention yes thank you and uh, finally uh, Econ Stemble will uh, talk about how to engage uh, non uh, non-researchers into language resources. Here you are. So, um, yeah, I'm following up on, on, on the last talk, which was nice um, because ours 
will bring together um, or will drill down on, on, on from the larger picture of, of uh, Italy to the very local surrounding um, our immediate um, surrounding and it's work that uh, has been created together with, with uh, Verena Lüding and Alexander Koenig. It took place over um, about two and a half years, a uh, time span of two and a half years and um, it's, it's basically finished. Um, Verena and I work at Eurac Research, and we are part of the of the Eurac Research Clarin Center, one of the the, the ones in Italy. And uh, back then, when this work was mainly done, Alex was also with us, but he's now working at Clarin Eric. Um, should be somewhere in the in the participants. Um, next slide, please. Yes, um, as I said, our project targeted local partners. This is partners in our immediate surrounding, in the vicinity. Um, and it is, as a result, this means that we cannot focus on a, on a, on a very specialized domain as for example, um, many of those um, large scale infrastructures do. I think there was one slide before about um, Alexis, but it doesn't really matter. So um, like a, a large European uh, project like Alexis, and for those who don't know it, it's it's a, a, a project on electronic lexicography. And in our surrounding, we would have too few potential partners um, to consider for such a specialized topic. On the other hand, these large infrastructures that you can see here, um, Daria, the, the ELG, Clarin as, um, as one, but also the, the, the presented SSH, uh, the S-Shock, um, they, they make an effort and try to reach out to people who are, uh, who are not interested or beyond research. But in our experience, um, many such parties uh, do know little about these large European projects um, or they do not feel addressed by them. And, and if they do, the hurdles to, to contact them and to actually get involved are often too high. And so they, they prefer not to, not to engage or um, not as much as it would be, um, as it would be, as we would hope for. Okay, next slide, please. Um, okay, next slide. I think the order here was wrong. Okay, so um, here in, in South Tyrol, that is a part of Italy in the very north, where um, besides Italian, there is also a variety of German um, that is spoken and also a, a, small, a small part of the population uh, speaks Latin. And um, we have to approach local partners to so that they can participate in some let's call it digital humanities activities. And after some back and forth, um, we found three partners for a project that is the, the local um, library for German, for mainly responsible for German texts, the local cultural institute and um, a newspaper portal, Salto BZ. And I will mainly focus on work that was carried out with Salto BZ, the newspaper portal. Uh, next slide, please. Our overall aim, basically is to bring together text producers because we are interested in corpus linguistic work on, on the German variety or on Latin or also on some Italian aspects or aspects of the Italian as it is spoken here. And so we're interested in, in many producers. Therefore we need, instead of a target uh, of targeting a very specific field like uh, Alexis does for lexicography, we need to target local actors um, with a um, with language who use language resources in in many different ways. Um, ideally, we need to build a network of different actors at the local level to achieve synergies between their and our activities. And we also need to focus on non-research partners because there are not so many research partners. And if you're interested in text producers, we can't, we can't exclude them. We basically need to focus on them. Um, and they're usually not, not very familiar with large infrastructures, not Clarin or any other one. Okay, next slide, please. The challenges of finding someone are not small because first and foremost, we need someone, we need to partner up. They usually go along their businesses and they don't really care about us. So we need to sort of make it attractive to them. Um, 
But then any invested time from them, so invested time equals money, usually must bring some revenue. For example, um, we actually got money from our region to for this project and so we could offer our partners some some amount of money but three out of four newspapers were still not interested even though we could offer them some money for participating in this project once partners were found it's still difficult to imagine use cases that could be explored because their knowledge of of uh, natural language processing technology is often vague and sometimes they just overestimate what, what can be done or they have no idea about what actually could be done. Um, then, of course, they fear any, usually any disruption in their established workflows. And so they are very wary of making unnecessary changes. Um, and the, the abstract added value of something like an evaluation metric that can be improved, a, a promise of an improved experience, uh, some prototype that works on different data than their actual data, because that sometimes can't be used right away, um, is, not, is often not very convincing, or not convincing enough. Okay, next slide, please. So the cooperation with the, the newspaper portal, um, the one that actually took place resulted in um, an improved or an improvement rather of, of a search service for their text archive, like an online newspaper text archive, their one, um, of uh, full text search and, and uh, some metadata, um, date and authors and uh, these sort of things. Um, and then a system that we developed for automatic suggestion of keywords um, that was accompanied by some manual refinement after after suggesting after automatic suggestion, and then the 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 part that needs to be uh, sort of considered is that while the implementation of this technical part was was mainly on our side and we cooperated with people that we direct that we were directly involved with, the system and the use of the system of of uh, of adding keywords in the process of um, creating an article. Um, so the design implementation of and enforcement of, of this organizational part was mostly on their side. And also it involved people that we were only indirectly involved with. Basically the newspaper authors who may not even be working full time for, for Salto or may even um, yeah, only come by every now and then to, to sort of write an, write an article. Okay, Thanks. next slide. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we are really out of time. So okay, yeah, I'm I'm basically I'm basically done. So this is sort of the interface that you can skip. Sorry, um, that's not that important. And um, I think the most the most important part is that um, to consider that not technical improvements, um, but also uh organizational integration of of anything that that is part of such a project needs to be taken into uh, account and um the the continuation the financial continuation of projects uh, afterwards is sort of the the big issue that that uh, we've we found uh, so Jurgita, it is your turn now hello <laughs> Uh, so, good day. My name is Irgita Vichanonen, and I'll continue sharing this part of the session on research data management, metadata, and creation. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Klaus Zinn, who will present a new tool designed to help researchers in their data management. You are welcome. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we do. Uh, so welcome to my talk. Uh, I'd like to talk about Bagman, um, a new tool that I'm currently developing at the University of Tübingen. Next slide, please. Uh, the main motivation for Bagman comes from our own linguistics department, where we have lots of researchers creating and working with research data, and where we also host the Tala archive of um, uh, language resources, where we try to archive research data coming from these researchers. Research data management is not easy as having the data is not enough for making uh, your research data available uh, to others for archiving. You have to go through a lot of household cores um, before you want others to see and make sense of your data. That is to make it usable, but also findable. To help researchers uh, with all of this or some of this, 
required. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, we envision tool support to be necessary for three areas, um, data packaging, metadata assignment, and um, the uh, archiving procedure. With respect to data packaging, rather than submitting your research data to your archive via email, USB sticks, cloud uploads, you need to make sure that all data has been submitted in a complete and correct manner. Um, to ensure proper delivery, our software Bagman uh, uses a certain uh, specification that ensures that. Um, metadata assignment is probably the task that creates the most hassle for our researchers in tubing in, as some researchers just don't want to get into Cindy, metadata profiles, XML editors, um, etc. And last, finding the right archive is not an easy matter as often archives are specialized in holding particular types of resources. That is, researchers ask themselves, where should my data best go, uh, for instance, to ensure, uh, to maximize uh, the visibility of the data. Um, enter Bagman, our software. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, um, so Bagman is a web-based software. It aims at supporting both researchers and archive managers. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, um, so an important part of uh, Bagman is the elicitation of metadata from researchers via um, web-based forms. In Bagman, metadata is divided into different categories, such as metadata about the project and organization in which the data has been collected, but also data specific to the type of research data. Here, Bagman supports all CIMB profiles that we are using uh, by the tubing by tubing and uh, uh, Next slide, please. Um, here you see a couple of uh, further screenshots from Bagman. Uh, you see uh, a bit blurry a visualization of a file tree of the uh, research data that the researcher has, uh, has uploaded. Uh, you see that the bag uh, that has been created uh, and you see a table where each file is associated uh, with a checksum that is unique uh, to um, a file's content. Um, next slide, please. Um, you can try out Bagman uh, at the following address uh, given uh, on uh, at the top of the slide. Uh, Bagman is a fully functional prototype, uh, but uh, for the time being, only the Tala, the Tala archive in Tübingen is uh, connected. In the future, um, other archives will be connected, which also means that uh, more SIMD matter be supported uh, by Bagman. If you try out Bagman, uh, please uh, give us your feedback. And uh, last slide. Um, yeah, uh, the main selling point for Bagman is probably the automatic generation of SIMD uh, metadata from all the data supplied by the user via the web-based forms and the files uh, they upload. In Bagman, there is no direct editing of SIMD. Bagman also does not try to enforce that all web forms are being filled out. There is mandatory information to be supplied, but there are also forms which are not mandatory. Uh, archive managers like that they now receive a package of research data using the Bagman. When they receive such a package via Bagman, they can run a single script to verify that they have received all content in a complete and uh, uncorrupted manner. Um, I think I stop here. Time's up. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you. I wanted to say thank you and would like to uh, invite Hannah Henneland and Thomas Schmidt to present their work on interoperability enhancement of spoken language resources taught across different clearing centers, archives, and other spaces. You're welcome. Yes. Uh, Thank you. I'm going to talk a bit about this TI-based ISO standard transcription of spoken language, as you said, together with uh, Thomas Schmidt, who is now at the University of Basel. He used to be at the EDS in Mannheim, where I'm currently working. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so if we look at into transcription of spoken language, first of all, we recognize that it's more complex than written language. We don't only have the situation where we have multiple participants and maybe overlapping speech, but we also have Lots of other things in this single stream. We also have non token elements like pauses or nonverbal behavior, which is also encoded. 
And since there is no standard single way of uh, putting spoken language into writing, there are several transcription systems in use. And all of these systems, they, and although it's, maybe it's annoying, they need to exist because they all encode uh, various theories about language and communication. So we cannot harmonize transcription just by having everybody use one system. However, we have seen over the years that some aspects of transcription can be standardized because they are not theory dependent. And this is what this, um, this um, ICTI standard is about. So uh, we single out these aspects and we try to standardize them using TEI. And if we look at the example below, we see that some things, these are two uh, transcription systems widely used in Germany. We see that some things are all, um, they are used um, in the same way and uh, described the same way. We see a coughing that is um, denoted in the same way in both uh, systems. And we also uh, see the full stops. They look the same. However, they mean completely different things. And then we see things like pauses and this insecurity on behalf of the transcriber. Did someone say black or blue? They look kind of the same, but still not really. And it's easy maybe for us humans to see that, but for a machine, obviously it's not that easy. So if we move on to the next slide, we see what will happen if we can use uh, the ISOTI standard to actually model this example using the two various transcription systems. Then we see that things that were actually the same but looked a bit different, they now also look the same and can be processed. And we still have kept this very relevant difference, which is that one system uses segments below the speaker contribution level, which are intonation phrases, and the other one uses utterances like a chromatic based uh, a unit. So uh, of course we cannot just get rid of this or harmonize this by using automatic conversion. And what we gain with this ISOTI standard, which is not only that we have syntactic interoperability, uh, because the ICTI standard can actually model all widely used tool formats, but we also get, by mapping on the standards, we also get a basic semantic interoperability for transcription data. So uh, this is the reason why we have not only created uh, import and export filters for the Exmeralda transcription and annotation tool, but we also use this format as an exchange uh, format for various contexts where um, originally uh, they were developed for a written language data, and we could use this uh, format as an exchange format to also allow for spoken language data to be processed. And if you're a regular attendee at the annual conference, maybe you have, uh, maybe you remember the, the presentation of the Clarendy Weblet integration in 2017, in 2018, back again with the web annual annotation platform integration, also based on the ICTI standard. And then recently, uh, there has been work at the EDS Mannheim in the project Sumult, led by Thomas Schmidt where um, they have developed something based on the MTAS system, which was presented at the annual conference, I think in 2016 by a Dutch college. And um, based on this uh, system, uh, they have created um, a, a corpus query platform where you can actually query ICTI data using CQP. And the Zoomul project also has some other applications, for example, a revisualization of transcripts. Um, next slide, please. So in a way, this is very much about Spoken language data are very specific. And in another way, maybe it's not. Maybe it's also about TI and clarin, about data fairness and semantic interoperability, and how we can make TI data even fairer, especially in the sense of interoperability, if you look at the fair um, principles. And I think that these are some common challenges. I think also that clarin is in a very good position to tackle these challenges in the coming years. So I'm looking forward to that. And then there is only one slide left. And yeah, so thank you very much for your attention. I can put these links also in the chat. Thank you, that would be really great. And, and uh, now I would like to invite our last speaker, Tobias Weber, who introduced us the novel suggestion on data citation tracking method. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so um, we can already go to the next slide. Um, as, as you just said, um, I would like to talk about uh, citation tracking. Importantly, this has not been implemented yet. So um, please <laughs> bear with me. I'm, I'm a linguist. I'm, I'm mostly knowing the um, Clarin um, services, the Clarin websites from the front end, not from the back end. But I would like to, to think of ways in which we can, on the one hand, get citation tracking, um, including publications from the past, but also somehow show how different versions of cited linguistic data belong together, 
how they're related to each other. As I said, this has not been implemented yet, but there are two conference papers, um, which I'm also building, where I'm elaborating this concept a bit further. So if you're interested, the links are on the slide here. Um, they're also referenced in the, in the um, conference paper. So if you check the proceedings, you can also find them there. Next slide, please. Why Claren? Um, on the one hand, and, and this is from my outside perspective as, as a user, um, Claren has the necessary infrastructures to make this happen. On the one hand, there are, is computational computation power at the um, participating centers. There is um, computation power and um, knowledge also uh, in the staff and the researchers associated with Claren. And secondly, I think the formats of the virtual collections, the relational data and metadata formats are very useful in what we're trying to achieve. Also, the front end, what I know, uh, the switchboard and the um, language observatory, they are really good and, and useful in, in looking at, um, at how data is connected and with adding some more functionalities to that, I think we can also track citations of linguistic data. Claren also has data. So we don't even need to look far to, to see where we can start because there is modern language data, of course, the things that are currently created and deposited in um, uh, the centers, but also, and this is why I think it's becoming more interesting, historical data sets, because there, there is data in, in the Claren networks that existed prior to digital object identifiers, other identifiers that we would nowadays use for citing data. Um, and of course, they have been added nowadays, but in publications that predate their introduction, they won't be cited because they have existed then. Finally, I think um, Claren also has the political weight. If I, as, a, as an individual, would go and ask um, publishers to share their, their data with me, share their publications with me, they'd probably turn me down. But I think if, if there's the will, and this is a call for action, if there's the will to implement this, um, I think Claren could um, pull some weights and get access to publications. Next slide, please. How would I like to go about this? First of all, I would like to treat published text linguistic articles as the input. I would like to parse them. I want to go through it with a string matching similarity analysis to find out where are the linguistic examples that we have in our databases. We can also look at the metadata. We can also see are there is there any digital object identifier? Is there something cited that links to the data? Of course, this would be ideal, but this doesn't always happen. The second point on, you see on the slide, um, once we have extracted them, is quite important to what I want to achieve in the third step. Namely, I want to not just mention this was cited in this place, but I want to look at how was it cited. I want to establish relationships because what we publish in linguistic papers is not just raw data. We annotate it, we translate it, we analyze it, we take parsed parts of it, we compile it with other things. We, we use it as an example for or against uh, some theory that we're trying to prove or disprove. So what the, the potential in there is to show not just who uses data, where is data used, but also how is it used. And once we have different versions and we know how they might be related, tentatively related versions of each other, of the original that we have stored in the archives, then we could turn that into a graph. And this graph and all the different annotations, analyses, we can display that to the public. And I think exactly through the switchboard, through the VLO, we have the tools to show those relations that you can select. I want to see the analyses that come from a generativist school, from a structuralist school. I want to see translations into Estonian, into Russian, into Swedish. And this is where I would like to, to go with that. If you go one slide further, um, I've tried to outline this somehow. You don't have to, to understand this by just looking at it. The, this um, graphic is in the paper. And I would like to return to it if you would like to talk about it in more detail. I'm happy to do that in the q and I'm happy to do that um, later outside the conference. My contact details are on the following slide. And um, with that, I'm ending my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I am sure that the idea will be implemented 
Um, and as we don't have time for the QA session, I, I think I give the word to the following uh, session chair, Krista Linden, uh, and invite to continue with. So the next uh, session is on uh, legal issues uh, related to the use of language resource in research. And uh, the topic is legal issues related to the use of Twitter data in language research. And Pavel Komotsky will be the first presenter. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Krista. Uh, <clears throat> yes, so um, uh, my... Uh, very brief presentation will be about the use of Twitter data for uh, building uh, language resources. Uh, it's um, it, I will present a work that we have done jointly in the um, uh, Claren uh, Legal and Ethical Issues Committee with a group of co-authors, including uh, the chair of uh, this uh, session, uh, Krista. Uh, so um, those of you who are here for a quick answer, can I use Twitter data to build language resources? The answer is yes. Uh, and there are even several ways of doing this. And I hope um, this uh, paper will provide more insights into this. Can you please move to the next slide? So Twitter is a very important source of language data. Uh, it's huge. It's still growing, and yet few tweet corpora are widely known. It hasn't brought to my attention. So I was wondering, why is it so? Is it because of the gray zones, legal gray zones, um, um, uh, having to do with sharing of uh, Twitter data? Uh, can we please move on to the next slide? Indeed, tweets can be protected by copyright. Maximum length of a, of a tweet is currently 280 characters, which roughly, I think, translates to 50, 60 words in English, um, which is more than enough to meet the originality standard. Last year, uh, I presented a paper in which I argued that actually three words is enough to uh, meet uh, the, the originality uh, criteria. Of course, most tweets, arguably, will still not be original, but it is impossible to sort uh, sort them out. I mean, it is impossible to automatically distinguish between original and non-original tweets, which means that while analyzing tweets in, in bulk, uh, in very large quantities, uh, copyright issues cannot be uh, completely ignored. Who holds copyright in tweets, you will ask? Well, the authors of the tweets hold copyright, but they grant uh, a very broad, although non-exclusive, license to Twitter to disseminate the tweets. Uh, can we please move on to the next slide? Uh, tweets can also obviously contain uh, personal data. Uh, let me remind you that uh, this concept is very broadly defined in the GDPR as any information related to an identifiable person. However, Twitter offers sophisticated privacy parameters that allow the user to fine tune uh, the uh, uh, privacy settings of, um, of, of the tweets. Is it publicly available? Uh, it's also possible to delete tweets, which can be interpreted as withdrawal of consent. So um, this allows us to, 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 to think that tweeting to the public um, is, uh, can actually be interpreted as consent uh, for uh, processing of personal data for research purposes, because tw Twitter uh, uh, includes this information in its privacy policy that tweets, uh, tweets are indeed used uh, for research purposes. However, the problem is that if uh, a user withdraws a tweet, deletes a tweet, that is withdraws uh, a consent, uh, how do we do about it if the, if the tweet is already in the corpus? Can we delete it from the corpus and how? So this is a technical rather than a legal uh, difficulty in this respect. Can we please move on to the next slide? There are also uh, contractual issues about mining tweets. tweets. Uh, Twitter is, uh, one can say, uh, prima facie, a little bit schizophrenic about uh, uh, data mining because it prohibits uh, scraping tweets uh, in its terms of service, 
without uh, specific permission. Uh, but it also provides uh, an, an application processing interface specifically for mining tweets. And there is even a special track for researchers. So when it comes to uh, your relation with Twitter, your terms of service with Twitter, you can only mine tweets, tweets via the dedicated um, API. But as a researcher, you can get, excuse me, uh, uh, you can get uh, preferential access to the uh, API. Um, um, there are some problems with the API. Uh, in order to get access to the API, you have to answer the detailed questionnaire. Uh, and the uh, access to the API can be um, uh, limited, uh, can be terminated by Twitter unilaterally uh, at any time and for any reason, uh, including no reason at all. There is an alternative perhaps to the use of uh, APIs, uh, which is uh, the new uh, exception for text and data mining uh, in the new, uh, relatively new directive on copyright in the digital single market. This new um, exception uh, overrides uh, contracts, which means that it would override the prohibition in Twitter terms of service, the prohibition of uh, mining. However, it creates some further problems. It is not you clear. You need to uh, stop now because we have one yes. final uh, presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Krista. And um, yes, thank you. And good luck for the remainder of the session. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we are really short of time here uh, because uh, so there is four and a half minutes left for or four minutes actually only for these ethnomusicological archives and copyright issues and Italian case study and I believe Prospero Marra will be presenting. Uh, actually, I'm Ducio Picardi. <laughs> anyway, oh, no, sorry, Ducio yeah. Picardi. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, we're a research group at Sen University in Italy and we are now working on their two view projects. The project is sponsored by the region of Tuscany and aims to develop a web infrastructure hosting our archives with particular regard to novel aspects of digital philology, metadata, and audio restoration. The project is currently dealing with its first challenging case study, the Caterina Bueno Ethnomusicological Archive. Caterina Bueno was an Italian folk singer who collected a huge corpus of heterogeneous oral materials, including field interviews with singing informants, live events, and band rehearsals. In this presentation, we tackle the complex legal management of the archive with particular reference to copyright issues. Next slide, please. As a preliminary remark, it should be noted that copyright laws pertain to the contents of the archive and not to the physical carriers of the data. In Italy, the reference copyright law is a 633-1941. Buenos materials include the voices of several subjects who may claim copyright infringements, the original singers, Buenos informants, the author of the rearrangements, Catherine Bueno herself or her heads, and the performance of Caterina Buenos Band. Next slide, please. Let us start our review by looking at authorship rights. Concerning the authors of the original compositions, it can be safely assumed that our task and full songs are in public domain, since 70 years most sensibly passed since the death of the author. Execution or arrangement authorship should be regarded as a minor concern as well. In order to claim these rights, the Italian law requires substantial levels of creative regions. However, this vague definition promotes disputability, and in any case, only those reports are needed to substantiate such claims. Next slide, slide, please. Performer rights is where things will get a little bit dicey. Nevertheless, it should be noted that the rights concerning recording authorization or fixation are of low level risk as well. Since the circumstances of the recorded events, either being field or sessions or music performances, presuppose the explicit consent of the performance. On the contrary, there is no way out the rights concerning digital reproduction. Indeed, the only legal exception of caching does not pertain to our online platform. The same can be stated about diffusion rights. Even though we decided to rely on streaming services and not on direct downloads, dealing with the World Wide Web required to gather written authorization from the performance. Two factors may help mitigate this need. Firstly, a work can be considered orphan if meticulous reports fail to pinpoint its exact, its, its exact performer. Secondly, the Italian law leaves room for disputability in its protection of performers playing a noticeable artistic role in the contested work. There are no unequivocal guidelines to define these noticeable roles. Next slide. Lastly, the compensation for subsequent uses is an unalienable right, uh, which should be never explicitly surrendered. Nevertheless, Archivo Vivo is a non-profit endeavor. 
In this sense, quantifying the estimated profitability of the materials is quite problematic. Moreover, Archivo Vivo implements a federated access system powered by Clarin IT, and this should be enough to monitor user access and to rule out the definition of public repurposing needed in order to trigger compensation claims. Next slide, please. To sum up, when dealing with an Italian ethnomusicological archive, do not underestimate the risks coming from performer rights, in particular reproduction and diffusion rights. As a final remark, please note that pure analogical reasoning is not recommended from a legal standpoint. Always consider your needs on a case-by-case -case basis. Currently, we are about to gather the informed consent forms from Catalina Buenos performers while devising a license formula for the diffusion of the materials. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you.